Last month, the Texas Department of Criminal Justice received this kind of remarkable letter uh, from a local pharmacy. Dear sirs and madam, I'm the owner and pharmacist in charge of the Woodlands Compounding Pharmacy. Based on the phone calls I had with the Texas Department of Criminal Justice regarding its request for these drugs, it was my belief that this information would be kept on the down low. I'm not making it up. That's what it says in the letter. It was my belief that this information would be kept on the down low and that it was unlikely that it would be discovered that my pharmacy provided these drugs. Had I known that this information would be made public, I never would have agreed to provide the drugs. The Texas prison system got that letter after they had struck an, I guess, halfway secret deal with this one pharmacy to get lethal injection drugs for Texas's many, many executions of state prisoners. And when the name of the pharmacy and what they were doing was made public, the pharmacy decided it no longer wanted to go through with it. Texas is number one when it comes to the death penalty, of course, but lots of states have been having trouble recently getting the drugs that they want to use to kill their prisoners. Many of the companies that make those drugs, the st drugs the states were using to kill their prisoners, no longer want their drugs to be used for that purpose. So companies are refusing to sell states these drugs that they've been selling them for years. So Texas is on the down low with a local compounding pharmacist. Ohio had an execution scheduled for this week until it was delayed to see if the prisoner might be able to donate his organs. Before the delay, though, Ohio had said its stock of execution drugs in that state was rapidly expiring and they were looking for new sources. So who knows what that means for the delay? Now, in Missouri, a new execution protocol is being set up to be used for the first time this month. The Department of Corrections there is flat out refusing to say where they are getting their supply of lethal injection drugs. They also will not say anymore what medical professionals are involved in the process of carrying out the killing. Now, we've always had fights about the death penalty forever since, like, the Bible, right? But this new issue about finding the drugs to kill people with, and in Missouri, the secrecy around the drugs and the protocol by which they're going to be administered, this is a whole new wrinkle in the fight. But in Missouri specifically, there is an even newer, even weirder wrinkle in the state's next planned killing. And the new weird thing Missouri has to contend with is Hustler Magazine and the publisher of Hustler magazine. The publisher of Hustler magazine is, of course, almost as famous as the magazine itself. He is Larry Flint. In 1978, Hustler magazine published a photo spread featuring an interracial couple, or at least an interracial coupling. At the time that that spread came out, a white supremacist neo-Nazi serial killer named Joseph Paul Franklin was in the midst of a multi-state killing spree that involved him singling out his victims on the basis of race and religion. For example, he staked out a bar mitzvah outside St. Louis and shot people as they left the temple. He shot two young cousins in Cincinnati just because they were black. He confessed to shooting civil rights activist Vernon Jordan because he says he saw Mr. Jordan near a white woman. That one was in Indiana. Again and again, he specifically sought out interracial couples to attack and murder. And when he saw that interracial pornographic feature in Hustler magazine, the neo-Nazi serial killer decided that Hustler magazine publisher Larry Flint also had to die. So the neo-Nazi serial killer essentially stalked Larry Flint, tried to find a place where he might be able to kill him. He learned that Larry Flint was going to be at a courthouse in Georgia, appearing in one of his many, many trials for obscenity. And Joseph Paul Franklin went to that courthouse, and he laid in wait, and when he had Larry Flint in his sights, he shot him with a hunting rifle. He paralyzed Mr. Flint from the waist down for life. That was 35 years ago. When police finally caught up with the killer, they tried and convicted him for eight different murders, although he says he killed many more than that. He says he killed upward of 20 people. They never prosecuted Mr. Franklin specifically for shooting Larry Flint, but he confessed to that shooting and he was sentenced to death for his other crimes. And he is the killer for whom the state of Missouri is now refusing to say exactly what they're going to do as their means of killing him. They will not say what it is they're going to use to end his life, where they got it, or who will administer it, or how. The state has set an execution date for him for Wednesday of next week. And now, Larry Flint, Larry Flint, publisher of Hustler Magazine, is working with the ACLU to try to stop the execution. Larry Flint fighting to save the neo-Nazi who shot and paralyzed him. He is our guest for the interview tonight. 
Stay with us, seriously. But a block from the courthouse and minutes before the trial was to resume, Flint and one of his lawyers were shot. Witnesses said a gunman emerged from a car and fired two shots, one hitting Flint in the stomach. The other bullet struck lawyer Gene Reeves in the side. The men were rushed to a hospital and immediately sent to surgery. Both are listed in critical condition. That was NBC Nightly News on the day that Hustler Magazine's Larry Flint was shot outside a Georgia courtroom. The man who confessed to shooting him, Joseph Paul Franklin, is now on death row for convictions in a string of murders in the 1970s that were motivated by his neo-Nazi and white supremacist beliefs at the time. He's scheduled to be executed in Missouri next week. But Larry Flint, one of this man's victims, is now working with the ACLU to try to stop that execution. Joining us now to explain why is Larry Flint. He's here tonight for the interview. Mr. Flint, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Rachel. Why, why do you want to stop this execution? Uh, well, you know, when I wrote that piece for the Hollywood Reporter, I didn't expect it to go viral. You know, I've uh, been against the death penalty for as long as I can remember. Uh, I just don't think we should be in the business of killing people for lives that we're trying to protect. Is there part of you... Is there part of you for which it is difficult to separate that long-held political belief of yours from, I would guess, an understandable anger or desire for vengeance against the guy who put you in a wheelchair for life? Uh, no, because I'm very pragmatic. You know, if you're a victim of uh, someone who's committed a crime like murder or something, I can understand uh, why you would want to see someone put to death. But when you really stay take time to think about the fact that our system is supposed to be about justice, not vengeance. And when someone sets out to commit a crime like murder, uh, they don't stop and think, well, am I going to get the life in prison or am I going to get the death penalty if I do this? That's not the way they think. It's not a death uh, it's not a deterrent. It never has been. And you know, in England in the 18th century, pickpocketing was a capital offense. And they used to hang the pickpockets every Saturday in the town square. And while they were doing it, people would be going through the crowd, picking the pockets of the people watching the pickpockets getting hanged. So I think the British caught on very early, you know. The capital punishment was not a deterrent. And when you look at the biggest proponents in the world of capital punishment, the three biggest are Iran, the United States, and China. Why do we want to be lumped in with them barbarians? You know, I can understand, you know, people wanting justice. I just don't understand vengeance. We, it's much, much tougher on a guy if you give him, put him in a three by six cell for the rest of his life rather than sniff his uh, life out with a, a lethal uh, injection in a matter of seconds. But as far as how they're putting these people to death, I want to remind you, Rachel, that a few years ago down in Florida, they was having trouble with the electric chair and they kept hiding the issues because people were actually burning up, getting caught on fire, and there was a lot of suffering. They weren't dying uh, right away. And I, I think maybe Florida has, has solved that problem by now. But uh, these prisons, if they are going to continue to use the death penalty, uh, there needs to be more transparency. I think we're entitled to it. Your effort with the ACLU, the legal filing that you made in this case, is to try to get Missouri to unseal documents about their execution and explain what they're doing. Is that basically just that, that's the leverage you've got to try to slow it down, or do you think that would make a difference uh, against the death penalty broadly? No, no, I think it'll make a difference because the, the more clatter, the more attention we get. Uh, you know, anesthesiologists are supposed to be administering these drugs. They're supposed to be board certified. They take an oath. They're not supposed to be, uh, you know, killing people for fun. And uh, I, I think all of that needs to be exposed. Larry Flint, the CEO of the Flint Management Group, uh, who's been uh, very kind to this show uh, and very generous to us over the years, uh, sir, just in terms of your willingness to come and be, in, uh, to be here and talk to us. Thanks, thanks for helping us understand this tonight, sir. Thank you, Rachel. I appreciate it. All right. If you are in need of 